Morning, everybody. Sorry about the tech support issue. Um, welcome to Ask the Expert, episode five on temperature. My name is Highland Joseph, and I'll be your moderator today. We'll be presenting on temperature with Michael Sheehan. We'll do a short seminar explaining the equipment and allow up to 20 minutes for questions. The Ask the Expert series is for all techs and for everybody involved in the specialty coffee industry. We're committed to doing this every Friday for the duration, except the holidays. The next one will be Christopher Brown and um, opening a tech business. Um, if you guys have any questions, the questions start right away. So just let us know. And with that, I'd like to introduce Michael T and get, let, get going on our presentation. Michael, talk, why don't you tell us about yourself before you start? Hey, Highland. Uh, my name is Michael Tehan. Um, I live in Southern California. I think that I've been in the coffee industry since dirt was new. Um, there, are, you know, there are a lot of people doing, that are doing some really cool stuff with uh, espresso technology and espresso equipment, and and doing research and R and D. Um, most of my experience has come from working with engineers um, and kind of be, just being around the industry. Uh, most of the engineers that I work with were from Italy, um, but I just kind of want to uh, put it out there that there are a lot of people that are doing some amazing work in terms of you know analyzing temperature and analyzing how espresso machines are working and logging data. It's really groundbreaking stuff, the kind of stuff that, that, that we weren't doing 30 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to acknowledge those that are doing that. Some, some of their graphs and some of, some of the stuff that they've produced I've incorporated into this um, presentation. Um, so even though I've you know, got kind of, te of a technical background, I kind of hope to bring more of a holistic view to how espresso machines work and what we're up against and you know, designing them and you know, putting them on the market and making them reliable and making them work. So um, with that, that's, that's basically about me. So Excellent. what I, in try so. <laughs> Excellent, um, and I appreciate your perspective. Um, are you ready to get started? Yeah, okay. uh, so let's go to the next slide. This is part of our technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, for technicians, you know, the most pressing issues that we that we have to deal with or that you have to deal with as techs um, are pretty simple. Um, it's about solving problems. You know, it's the usual stuff like, is it, you know, is the machine hot? You know, does it actually work? Does it function? Does it does it make coffee? Um, and, you know, and it's, it's the usual stuff of, of trying to diagnose stuff over the phone and making things work. This is the day to day boring stuff, um, but it's the kind of stuff that you have to deal with all the time. Um, Fixing things that break can be pretty simple compared to the subtleties of how machines actually work. And where it gets difficult from a technical technician standpoint is when you have to deal with baristas and owners that are asking you tough questions, like, you know, what temperature should it be at? And how, you know, how do I know that this machine is doing what it's supposed to be doing? Um, and that's what we'll kind of want to go over in the seminar today. So beyond just, you know, does the machine work? It's it isn't enough that it does that. Um, you know, pretty much any machine can make coffee and, and steam milk. Um, but let's go to the next slide, Highland. Highland, all right, go. So this, this is the big question. Um, is the machine hot enough? And it's a qualitative question. Um, and it's really about, you know, how does the machine interact with the coffee and is it producing what we want it to do? Um, and too often we, we, we look at numbers to solve a problem. Like, you know, what is the precise temperature or, you know, how are we measuring this or how are we measuring that? And we, we, we sometimes don't take a look at, you know, is the coffee coming out the way we want it to? Um, and only over the last maybe 20 years or so, have we been actually been able to look at equipment closely enough to determine whether or not um, it's providing, you know, the, the consistent temperatures that we need and what and what the effects of those temperatures were. You couldn't take a, you know, a 30 old, 30 year old espresso machine and tweak the temperature a couple of, you know, a half a degree up or down and see what it did to the coffee. And we can do those kinds of things now, but we couldn't do them before. Um, and this is where we, that this is, really kind of where the revolution in the industry is going. So Highland, next slide, please.
So, the, you know, the American experience with espresso machines has always been a little disconnected to Italian ideas of extraction. You know, we install machines as, you know, as manufacturer with little understanding of how they actually work, let alone what was intended. We know that pressure and temperature affected coffee, but we really lacked the precision necessary to evaluate what was happening. It's easy to understand how different temperatures impact flavor. If you look at like this top chart here, um, you know, average extraction yield relative to brewing temperature and espresso, we can see that at different temperatures, we're actually getting different components out of the coffee. Oftentimes it's simply analyzed with a TDS meter or um, sometimes it comes through with, with, with cupping and checking acidity and things like that. But every temperature has a different effect on the coffee depending on how it's roasted, how it's blended, what varietals are used, um, what pressures are applied to the machine. So we know that temperatures have an impact on what makes coffee unique and what makes it different. But how do we manipulate those temperatures in a coffee machine? So we've got the, the, the two graphs that are below that um, are talking about temperature, temperature profiles. In the US, we initially thought that stability and having the same temperature throughout the extraction process was like the gold standard. Um, you know, the SE, the, the Specialty Coffee Association adopted it, but it was what we really understood about coffee at the time. And in particular, you know, the, the, the holy grail was trying to obtain that temperature stability, whatever that temperature was. So, you know, you could take a particular kind of coffee and say, okay, this needs to be 92 or 90, 92 and a half degrees, and you can dial the machine into whatever that temperature was, but that was good for that coffee. Um, but some different things are happening. And the Italian perspective was a little bit different. Um, and I, I don't know that, you know, 50 years ago, they all sat around in their labs and were doing analysis on it. A lot of this, I think they got through luck. Um, they determined that coming in at a slightly different temperature than your extraction temp temperature produced different results. So if you manipulated the profile, the temperature profile, kind of like a roasting profile uh, of the espresso during the extraction, you could actually manipulate what flavors you got out of the components of that coffee as you actually extracted it. Um, so this is more of an Italian model. Um, so the, 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 the graph on the bottom reflects a traditional heat exchange kind of espresso machine um, that is pretty typical. And you can see that it's actually quite repeatable. So it's not like, it's not like an accident. Um, so that was what they were going for. So why do we want to change or even have the ability to change temperature as we extract the espresso. So Hyland, let's go to the next slide. So here's one reason why. Um, sometimes when we think of brewing coffee, we, we, we don't take a look at you know, the actual process involved. Like the, there's, there's two different ways to kind of make coffee in a sense. So on the left, we have saturation brewing, like, uh, like a French press. You take a fixed amount of coffee with a fixed amount of water, brewed at a particular temp or set at a particular temperature, and you let it steep. And, it's, and basically, the water then pulls all the compounds that you want out of that coffee for a specific amount of time um, until that water is saturated. Once it's saturated, it's not really pulling anything more out of the coffee. It's basically done. So whether it's like a French press or cold brew, um, once that water reaches a saturation level, it's not going to pull very much more out of the coffee, so it's kind of limited, um, but it's a relatively complete known process. Um, espresso is a little, a little bit different. Sometimes we think of what's happening in the puck as um, like a constant, like we have a fixed amount of coffee and we're, you know, we're, we're applying you know, 35 cc's of water at a certain temperature to it. But, it, but there's actually a little bit more nuance going, going on, and that's why we kind of want to manipulate temperature. Because the composition and flavor profile of the actual coffee that's in the puck while you're brewing it at five seconds in the, in the extraction process is radically different from what it is at, let's say, 15 seconds into the process. So what's actually in the coffee changes during the extraction, extraction process because the fresh water that's coming in isn't saturated with coffee. So it's gonna be pulling things out of that initial layer of coffee that perhaps you don't want. And by manipulating temperature, we can affect how some of those things are extracted during the extraction process. Um, and that's, what, that's, what, that, that's one possible reason why we want to be able to manipulate temperature as we actually extract the espresso. Um, so we can kind of pull different things at different times depending on what's happening in the coffee. Um, so, 
now that we have a kind of a rough understanding of why we might want to manipulate temperature and what some of those manipulations might be, um, let's talk about and take a look at how machines actually do that, both traditionally and you know what's happening now in the market. So Helen, let's go to the next slide. So it's important to know that heat is not a static thing. It doesn't just sit there and you know be hot. Um, it's fluid. It has to move. Um, it has. To, it, it relies upon change and and thermodynamics of the machine and fluid and everything else that's happening in it. Um, another thing to consider about espresso machines is that it's not just you're not, you're not just heating water at a particular point. An espresso machine is is like an ecosystem. There's a heat source. There's a cold water inlet. There's a point of delivery, and they're almost never in the same location. So temperature management in the machine is more about, is much more than just sensors, controllers, and elements. It's, it's about how the machine is designed to move heat from one place to another efficiently and predictably. Because you, know, you, you have you know, a heat source like an element that might be, you know, the, and the sensor might be you know, six inches away from that, but you're trying to regulate the temperature as a result of that sensor, but we're, you're delivering it you know, another 10 inches away that's you know, through a fluid circuit. So it's really the system at play. So even though we'd, we'd like to play with sensors and things like this, it's, it's really the system design of the machine that provides the stability and predictability for the concrete temperature coming out of the, out of the spout itself. So the first diagram, the one on the top, is a, is a traditional heat exchange machine. Um, and you know, it, it, I feel like a dinosaur now because this is the machine that I know the best. I, I know the best. Um, but it shows how hot, how hot water actually moves through the system, rising into the group and returning to the heat exchanger. And because heat rises, because you know physics, it actually works pretty well. The second drawing shows how the flow of water moves through a saturated group design. You know, it rises and returns in much the same way. But if you if you if you actually kind of look at how the diagram works, you can actually see the intended flow of you know warmer water flowing into the group in, and water then returning back to the boiler. This is a natural function of, of, of heat as it's, as it's moving through the system. And, and because of that, you know, heat has to move. So there are a couple of ways that heat actually does move through a machine. One is to the actual movement of water through this kind of convection current, this flow. Um, and the other is the material itself. And that's why materials are important. But, but one, one final thing about how heat is fluid. Um, in order for heat to move, it has to always be changing. So groups are radiating heat, radiating temperature. And as they cool, then the warmer, the, the warmer temperature from the boiler, from the heat exchanger, or whatever the heat source is, will then flow into that group as kind of a migration process to kind of achieve a thermal balance. Because you know, nature doesn't like anything out of balance. And that's, that's how espresso machines you know, from a systemic point of view, maintain temperature because you can't have like 30 or 40 sensors in a machine. It would, it would, it would just be ridiculous. So we talked a little bit about how water moves in a machine, but let's talk about, let's talk about material itself. Um, hi, let's go to the next slide. There we go. So if you want to distribute heat quickly and efficiently, really nothing is better than copper. Um, if this, 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 this chart actually kind of shows, you know, how quickly, uh, heat moves from one point to another based on the different kinds of metals that are used. Um, that's when the material of choice for a lot of boilers for a lot of decades um, was copper. Um, and be, because it's so efficient at moving things, it, it's, it's, it, does, it actually assists the, kind of the, the water in keeping everything warm. But it also loses heat just as easily as it moves it. Um, so, you know, the, the copper itself, while it while it transports pretty quickly, it also radiates just as fast. So it loses it just as quickly. And that's why, you know, materials like brass are kind of a buffer because brass can kind of, it, it isn't quite as fast. Um, it has a lot of the thermal mass uh, similarities of, of, of copper, but it, it, it kind of slows down that, uh, that radiation process um, and allows a little bit more stability. Um, I threw aluminum in there because um, aluminum as a, as a metal is pretty damn good, but um, it has a lot of corrosion issues and there's a lot of reasons why we don't, don't use aluminum. Um, but when you look at stainless steel, 
stainless steel is like the is like the weapon of choice for espresso machines now because consumers tend to like stainless. It uh, um, it's relatively easy to service. It's easy to manufacture. There's a perception that's it's it's safe in all circumstances. Um, but you can see it doesn't move heat energy very well. So when using a stain when when you when when you have a, a stainless steel as part of an espresso machine, it's not a you can't just take a machine that was designed for copper and brass and simply replace the components with stainless and call it good. It won't work. You have to actually design the machine around the stainless uh, to accommodate the the thermodynamics of what's happening with a stainless steel boiler or a stainless steel you know group or whatever it happens to be. And you can do that by moving water, um, and that's what some manufacturers have done. Um, so even though it isn't effective, it's it's durable and there's a lot of reasons you might want to use it. When you look at, at the, the final two, when you when you consider how water water works, when in terms of water uh, transferring heat energy, it it really sucks. Um, it has a lot of thermal mass, as you'll see in the next slide, but uh, in order for water to convey temperature, it has to move from one location to the other. Um, so that's why the, the, the thermosiphon systems work. That's why, um, you know, flow through designs in, 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 in like saturated groups work because they depend upon the movement of water to keep everything warm. Because if, if, if water just sits there, it's not gonna, it, it's not, it, it essentially it has to move to work. Um, hi, let's go to the next slide. And maybe you can tell me how I'm doing on time. <laughs> um, You're good. So while we've, got, we, we've got plenty of time. We'll go over a little bit because we're late. Okay. Um, so while metal is efficient at moving heat through a machine, being very dynamic, it doesn't store a lot of that thermal energy, and it doesn't do it as well as water. So the mass of water actually aids in thermal stability, kind of like a battery. But you have to be able to get that heat into the water and out of the water, and then move that water where you need it to go. So, you know, that that's kind of where the challenge is. So when I talk about ecosystems, it really is about utilizing the mass of water to store thermal energy to create stability and and, and exploiting the materials um, necessary to convey that heat energy throughout the whole system. Um, so this just kind of gives you an idea of what you know, like the of, of the comparative materials and thermal mass of, of what's happening in an espresso machine. So Let's go on to the next slide, Highland. So this this is you know kind of summing up my philosophy of, of how machines are designed, and it's about striking a balance. Um, and this is why machines, espresso machines, are actual systems. I mean, we can design machines that do what we want in different ways, but we really have to understand how each material works and how it interacts with water and the heating elements and the environment that it's in. Um, just as an uh, anecdotal, I, I installed a PID controller on a, a small one group espresso machine for a friend of mine. Um, and what, we've, what we determined was if we, if we insulated the boiler and insulated everything so it didn't reduce heat or did, didn't, um, didn't radiate very much heat, uh, the PID controller didn't work very well. It, it, it managed the temperature of the sensor, but what was actually coming out of the group was radically different than what was expected. So we removed all the insulation and allowed essentially the espresso machine to breathe, and everything came into and everything came into into um, uh, like an equilibrium. Everything worked just as it just as it was supposed to. So sometimes when we think what we're doing something when we're doing the right thing in terms of manipulating temperature, um, it isn't what it isn't like the expected result. So espresso machines have to breathe, they have to move, they have to lose heat in order to recover. So that's that's kind of my holistic approach to to espresso machines. So now let's get down into the weeds of um, um, how I usually get in trouble. <laughs> how do we control the heat? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about systems and and how things kind of agree with each other or disagree with each other. Um, but you know, essentially, there are just a few ways that 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 we can control what's happening in an espresso machine. Um, traditionally, espresso machines have used pressure controls. Um, pressure controls are kind of like the, the, it's kind of like the ultimate holistic um, system-wide 
uh, and now uh, control of what's happening with temperature in an espresso machine. Um, and the reason why that is, is because pressure and temperature are linked. Um, it's, it's like a, it's a, they're directly related to each other. Um, as temperature rises in the system, pressure increases in the system. Um, as it drops, pressure decreases. It's a very linear response. Um, so in a sense, you know, pressure controllers are actually kind of gauging and, and evaluating the, the, the temperature of the entire system from, of, of, you know, the, the boiler and everything else. Um, it's not relying upon a particular point of, of like a sensor, for example. Um, of course, the difficulty with, this, with, with pressure switches uh, is that they're either on or they're off. Uh, the hysteresis of, uh, an, or what we call a dead band of a pressure stat can be pretty bad, quite frankly. Um, you might get a two or a three de uh, temperature swing even out of the boiler. You know, some of the old uh, mercury pressure switches on the machines in the 50s sometimes had a five or six, five or six degree temperature swing. Um, things that would be horrific now, but were perfectly fine then. And, and depending on how the machine is designed, is fine now, actually. Um, but now a lot of machines are moving into, you know, whether they're isolated boilers, individual boilers, or separate boilers from steam, we're kind of removing the steam from the component of monitoring temperature. That gives us some more flexibility. So we're using sensors now. So this, and the, the sensor, depending on how, um, how detailed it is or how quickly it can respond, can be a really good tool in, in, terms, of, in terms of monitoring and changing the temperature of, uh, of, the, of the brewing system. However, a sensor is, is measuring the temperature at the sensor. Um, if the sensor is too far away from you know, where, where either where cold water is entering the boiler to, you know, to, refill, to, to replenish um, or it's pressurized in the system or if it's too far from the heating element, um, it's relying upon the material around it uh, to stimulate a response from the sensor. So, you know, you, 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 the, the, the sensor might, give you, might be giving you a very precise reading, but it's not necessarily telling you what the temperature is six inches away, or it's not telling you what the temperature is at the group. It's only telling you what the temperature is at the sensor. So the controllers that are used to, you know, in these kinds of systems are really, really good about maintaining the temperature of the sensor. You really need to incorporate the data you're getting from that sensor within the whole machine design uh, in order to, to really put it to use. And that's why, it, you know, the, the kind of a more holistic approach in the, that I've talked about. Um, so typically what you'll find now on espresso machines to maintain temperature are what are called PID controllers. Uh, PID controllers are really, really good at maintaining very precise temperatures. They, they actually, they'll either self-learn um, how to do that, or you can actually program a PID controller to uh, hit a set point and maintain that set point very predictably and very precisely. Um, but it only typically runs one program at a time. So if you have it, it, a PID controller, while it maintains that temperature and it maintains that temperature at the sensor, uh, it doesn't necessarily respond to different kinds of demands. So for example, if you are, if, if, an, if a machine has an incredible amount of like a surge of use, you know, you've got a, a, a line of a busload of Italian tourists, you know, just pulled in front of your espresso bar and you're pulling shot after shot after shot after shot. It's going to put, it's going to put a, a different level of demand on the machine than what it's used to. And while PID controllers are really good at maintaining temperature, it doesn't really know what to do when you have a varying um, demand. So in a sense that, we you know, while they're really good, it's kind of, it's, it's, the, it's, it's what we have now. And they're really good at, you know, maintaining the temperature of the sensor. Um, only a few machines now, and I'm, and I'm not even, I'm kind of out of the loop these days, um, are able to kind of uh, proactively anticipate what's going to happen as water flows into a, in, into a system. And so these are some, these are some of the control methods and, and some of their limitations. So what are we doing with modern machines now to give us more flexibility and more precise control? So Helen, let's go to the, let's go on to the next slide. And this is what I'm calling kind of micromanagement. 
So a lot of machines now are actually not just having a separate boiler for steam and water, they've actually incorporated the boiler directly into the group head. Um, this has some advantages, of course, because you can actually, you, you, have a, you have a control, you, you, you've got the sensor, the heating element, and the point of delivery in very close proximity to each other. Um, and what that means is it gives you better control and, and better inputs. So the sensor isn't you know, trying to measure some temperature that's far away from what's actually happening in terms of the delivery. The sensor is actually closer to the point of delivery and you can get you know, a little bit better results in terms of you know, the, the data you're getting from the sensor and how you're manipulating it and controlling it. Um, you still do, do have some limitations though because you know, water is still static um, and the material composition of whatever you're using to hold that water can make a difference because you know, you're trying to radiate, you're trying to you know, contain heat, you're trying to do a lot of different things at once. So material still makes a bit of a difference, but when you can actually, but, but actually having you know, the, the brewing system being controlled at the group itself, it solves a lot of problems. And it also provides a lot of flexibility. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, in, in, in Italy, for example, if, if a roaster wanted a particular kind of uh, temperature profile on their, on their machine, they can go to a manufacturer and they can say, you know, this is, you know, this is the temperature that I want as a static temperature. And this is the profile that I want. And you could manipulate the length of cold water injectors. You could manipulate the flow rate of the heat exchanger through the machine. And they could actually tell, they, they could actually tell the manufacturer, this is, this is what I'm looking for and a manufacturer could produce that for that particular roaster. Well, in today's market, we're not dealing typically with just like one kind of espresso all the time. Um, a lot of the shops now might have two or three or four different kinds of espresso that they're brewing, and they'll have each have it to be a different varietal or a different level of roast. They might have a different grind profile. So the kind of, the kind of things that roasters would ask manufacturers to do for their particular blend of coffee 20 or 30 years ago, um, we're actually asking a machine to do differently on a daily basis. And individual boilers at groups kind of give us that flexibility um, and, and allows the barista or you know, a shop owner to play with different kinds of temperature profiles in ways that we never could before. Um, but it's also important for them to kind of know what they're looking for. Uh, and you know, there's there's kind of a, um, you know, we we used to we used to joke with some of the other the other techs that you know you've got a machine that 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 basically runs like a Ferrari. It can do all these great things, but really, what you need to go to to do is simply go back and forth to work every day. Um, so it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that all of these features are going to be used, um, but it gives you the flexibility of kind of setting it up for for however, however the end user wants to use it. Um, now, given that level of control and flexibility, there are some limitations. Um, and the limitations are really about cost. Um, not everyone can afford, you know, a, a, a 25 or a $30,000 espresso machine sitting on their counter. Um, and manufacturers know this. That's why we have a broad line of equipment that can do a lot of things. And, so in a, in a, even from a technical standpoint, as machines get more expensive, they, they don't just get more expensive, they also get more complex. Um, you have a lot more things to go wrong. So from a technician standpoint, in terms of recommending machine, either recommending a machine or from a sales standpoint, try, trying to find the right fit for a customer, you know, it really is you know, how they're gonna use it and what their expectations are. Um, you can do some incredible things with these new modern espresso machines, um, but it's it's from a technical standpoint it's it's not always going to be easy so anyway so that, that this is kind of how we this is how i kind of think of you know you know equipment in general um you know there, there has to be you know a place for a seat at the table for everybody so let's go to the last slide highland um and this this kind of goes to my philosophy of uh of, of espresso equipment and and what we're actually trying to do. Um, it's really easy to get obsessed with numbers and precision and um, you know, analysis. And sometimes we're fi we forget that we're actually just making coffee. Um, so just how much temperature control is necessary. Um, 
while you know it's 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 really good to have um, and it's really good to look at numbers, sometimes we forget to just kind of um, kind of take it all in. One of the things that when I, whenever I would you know either do a service call or work with a client, um, the first thing I would do is walk behind the counter and pull a shot of espresso and see what it looked like. Um, we oftentimes uh, look at numbers to kind of save us, but we don't really just take a moment and look at the coffee and see what it's doing. Um, years ago, when I was judging some barista competitions, um, the you know the, the the espresso machines that were being used were often automatic you know automatic espresso machines. They would portion control and everything was fine, but but the the participants in the competitions uh, wouldn't use them. They everybody everyone was using you know the semi-automatic mode because they were obsessed with the timer. They wanted to make sure that they that that shot poured in a specific time, although that, uh, otherwise they would lose points. Um, so this kind of obsession with time and temperature, I think we kind of lose a sense of what we're really after. And when it comes to espresso machines, it's about getting the machine to where you want it, getting it to where it's making the coffee that you really enjoy and really want and having it doing and having it perform that day in and day out predictably and consistent consistently. So that's kind of my, my whole philosophy of of how things work in espresso machines and uh so no very good michael I, thank you okay um i'm gonna stop sharing the screen it's gonna go to me and you and then we'll start asking questions um, okay. the first question comes from vasilis and his question is is it possible to have the same temperature inside one multi-boiler for example, in a Dalacourt DC Pro or Evo, and inside mm -hmm. the coffee pack, I think it is very. It, it is very. I think it's very difficult to be stable. Many regards from Greece. <laughs> um, it is. It is difficult to be stable because you know different things are happening. It's like we used to. Um, when people would ask us, you know, like how hot is the boiler? Um, the, the the response we usually gave them was well where do you, where do you want to measure the temperature um and i was looking at some data uh uh from a gentleman in in um i think it was south korea last night um and it is possible to get really really stable temperatures you know at the porter filter where you're actually brewing the coffee um but that doesn't mean that you're you're that the temperature inside the boiler is stable because sometimes you're going to have to ma manipulate the temperature and the heating element profile in the boiler to get the stability you want at the point of extraction. Um, so in, in this case, you know, if, if you're looking for stability, you're, you're really looking at something like, like a, a temperature sensor in a porter filter, like a SCASE device or something like that, um, in order to gauge how the, how the machine is actually functioning. Because even within that boiler, you're going to get different temperatures at different places. Just because the sensor says that it's 92 degrees doesn't mean that you're delivering 92 at the point of extraction. Um, a lot of a lot of manufacturers will actually um, uh, do like an offset because they know that the temperature at the sensor is going to vary slightly from the expected point of delivery. So they'll actually program that offset in so that what you're actually seeing on the display is what you expect but not necessarily what the sensor is actually reading. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, actually okay. it does. Um, laser, I'm not going to go with last names, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> from which machine, and this actually comes one of my questions, because we discussed this during the, the Ask the Expert temperature um, thing that you, me, and Don did for the Guild. From which machine did you have your best shot, multi-boiler or classic? thermosymphonic, and it goes back to what we were discussing about why the best espresso is always off of an old piston machine. <laughs> um, well, I do love old piston machines, um, and there's a lot of reasons that I love them. Um, but to, to be fair, the, the best coffee that I've, that I've had were on, I would say, two different machines, um, and completely ridiculous ends of the spectrum. Um, one was I'm not, I'm not I, I should should I, should I should I say what kind of machine it was it was it was a, it was a machine that actually had um, a small boiler attached to the group itself um, and it was programmed to provide a declining temperature profile so it came in a little bit hot and then dropped the dropped the temperature as it extracted 
um, it was probably one of the best shots of espresso that I'd had at a trade show. Um, and uh, and, I, and, I've, and, I, and I've, I've told the gentleman who made it for me that, that very thing. Um, the other espresso that I've had that was consistently really, really good um, was on a machine that was gifted to me uh, by a factory in Italy 25 years ago that I modified it with a PID controller. Um, it also, it was, it was just this, like, it's kind of like a, almost like a Sylvia. So it's that, that other end of the spectrum. Um, it had a brass boiler. It had a big brass group. Um, it had a 1200 watt heating element in it. I PID controlled it. You know, I, I, I left the machine on all the time. So I never had to worry about, you know, ramp or anything like that. Um, but it delivered ridiculously good espresso all the time. So in a sense, you know, having the, the heat control source at the point of delivery and controlling it at the point of delivery, um, I think produces really good results. But, you know, having said that, you know, I've, I, I've got a small coffee shop here in Southern California. Um, the machine that we use in that shop is a lever machine. Wow. Because I love, I love lever machines. Um, and with all the stuff, it just as an anecdote, for all the things that we're talking about in terms of, you know, sophisticated temperature controls, um, if, if, you know, we, we used to, when we go to, go to Naples, for example, uh, on, on, on business, and we go to one of the coffee bars in Naples, um, it was far and away some of the best espresso I'd had anywhere. And they were, you know, all these big lever machines and nobody was timing anything. Nobody was checking anything. It was just this very mechanical, you know, this graceful levers going up and down, you know, in cups that were almost too hot to actually hold. Um, and I don't know if the reason why the espresso was so good there was because we were in Naples uh, be, or because of the machines and the expertise of the barista behind them. Um, so you really can get amazing coffee from almost any machine if it's properly set up and properly worked by a trained barista. Okay. Um, Ryan Watson asked this question, do you foresee machines in the future offering temperature profiling as a feature, much like pressure profiling is being offered? What do you think, how do you think this would be achieved? Um, they're, well, they're doing it now. In fact, temperature right. profiling came up before pressure profiling. Um, uh, you know, to talk about like the piston lever machines, for example, um, the, the lever machines, temperature profile and pressure profile natively, that's just how they're designed. Um, you know, temperature profiling was, was native on espresso machines almost from their creation. But the ability to temperature that profile um, on a, you know, on a, on a, on a per use basis, that's the thing that's relatively new. Um, that's the thing that uh, um, that's probably going to be implemented on machines going forward. But again, there's also there's also some degree of cost. Um, the machines are going to get much more expensive when you do that. They're also going to get more complicated. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be offered, but does it mean that you have to do that in, or in order to get truly first rate? You know, the the god shot of espresso. I don't think so. Really, what it does is it gives you some flexibility. It's like having launch mode on a Ferrari. You're not going to use it every day, but you're going to want it. Right. Um, Amit. Oh, Amit wants to come to your shop. Um, <laughs> Panos wants to know if the bigger the machine and the better the heat control. No, I don't think so. Um, okay. I mean, you can be more stable, but you don't necessarily have more control. Um, okay. So I, I'm going to ask my question that we kind of touched on at our at our um, at our at our seminar. The flavor profiles. What different flavor flavor profiles can you expect from a naked portafilter versus a standard portafilter? And we discussed the metaphor I got for this, which which is espresso from a the espresso going through a naked portafilter is similar to the difference between baking a cake in an oven and baking a cake in an oven with the door open. Find it, <laughs> yeah. I find that each one has different flavor profiles. How does temp affect that? And how does the actual temp of the Florida filter affect that? Um, okay, so we talked about how heat is, is, is maintained and stabilized and also radiated. 
Um, a portafilter filter is actually a component of the group. Uh, it's not some little accessory that you insert just to make the coffee. So what, what you have to think about is like the mass of the portafilter filter itself aids the temperature stability of the group itself. When you reduce the mass, it affects the temperature stability. The other thing that happens is when the espresso comes out of the filter basket, basket uh, itself, um, it's now exposed to open air in a naked portafilter. filter. So it's going to cool much more quickly on its way down to the down to the cup. Um, the other thing that happens is that in, in a non-naked portafilter, traditional portafilter, um, that espresso is kind of coalesced and combined and allowed to, you know, it's like the crema seems a little more dense to me when it comes out. Um, so it's a little bit warmer before it hits the cup. Um, I think it's it's controlled a little bit better. Uh, I mean, naked portafilters are really cool. Um, it's a really good tool to see if you're getting an even extraction. Um, I I prefer not to use one every day. It, it, you know, my espresso, my, my coffee cups start looking like a, um, a Jason Pollock painting. <laughs> I, I've actually found that um, with some of the new micro roasters, some of their lighter roasts actually taste better through a naked portafilter versus a regular portafilter. Um, Dennis Vogel asks, why do HX machines measure PID temp off boiler instead of group head? It seems group head is what you care about. Uh, well, on a, on a heat exchange machine, um, well, I mean, the, the, the controller doesn't quite work that way. So if you, if, you're, if you try to measure it at a group head, let's say you have a three group machine, um, depending on the usage of that machine, that temperature at that group head is gonna fluctuate. The, so you can't really use that as a gauge. And the way the system is designed, the, the temperature profiling that happens at the group head is predicated upon a known fixed quantity at the boiler itself. So you want to you want to have one standard, one constant. So if the constant is the boiler, then the temp temperature temperature ma ma manipulation on an HX machine is from the mechanical design of the machine that's going to the brewing group. So you can't really use, um, you, you can't really sense the temperature. You can't control it from the head. You can monitor it. You can kind of see what it's doing, but you can't really use it to control because that temperature is going to fluctuate and that then is going to, going to affect the temperature of all the other groups in the machine. Um, PID controllers for HX machines, temperature, you know, measuring temperature of the boiler, I don't think is a good fit anyway. Um, I think pressure controllers are actually better at controlling um, temperature in a HX machine than a PID controller is. Thank you. Um, okay, everybody, we're running close to nine, so we're gonna allow three more questions. So if you have questions, let's get them in. I've got a couple, um, and then we'll do a wrap up. So the next question comes from an email, actually. I'm gonna read it to you as it came in. Um, I'm not sure if you, if during the course of a busy day, I discovered that my espresso machine has started to dose shots that are cooler or hotter than the acceptable room temp, than the, than the acceptable temp range. Is there any way to rectify the problem on the spot? <laughs> um, I mean, you can flush the machine, um, but if, if, some, if something is causing that temperature differential, this something mechanical or electromechanical is happening. Um, and I, I don't think that you can change it on the spot, but, but just for, for some perspective, um, Machines, traditional machines, like heat exchange machines, will heat soak um, as they, they as they recover, you know, temperature and radiate temperature. Um, if a machine is idle for 30 minutes, uh, sometimes the set point or the, the desired temperature might be a little bit higher. So that's why you flush the group if it's been sitting for a while. Other machines, on the other hand, especially if you're using stainless steel, um, they'll actually lose temperature over time. So you'll have to actually flush the group to increase the temperature. Um, but no, if, 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 you're, if you're changing temperature sporadically or for, for some unknown reason during the course of a day and it's not predictable, then you've got a mechanical or, or, or a control issue that needs to be addressed. You can't, I don't think you can fix it on the fly. You can fix grind, you know, you can fix, um, you know, you can, you can overdose, you can, you can do a number of things to kind of manipulate the extraction, but you're not gonna be able to change the temperature. Um, talking about temperature profiling, with the with the compounds, the volatile compounds coming out of the shot of espresso, will the TDS change over the period of time, or will the TDS change 
with a different temperature profile? Yes. How will it change? Um, well, the first, the, the, one of the first charts I showed was, um, was some research done by a gentleman out of uh, Australia uh, using a TDS meter um, at, different, at different temperatures. So when you, when you come in cooler, you tend to extract less compounds from the espresso. Uh, when you come in a little bit too hot, you, you tend to extract many more compounds from the espresso, but some of those aren't desirable. Um, so by manipulating the temperature, you can kind of control what you're getting. Um, and it really depends on the roast, the grind, you know, the dose. There's a lot of factors in, involved. I mean, you know, we talk about we talk about temperature in espresso machines, um, but there's so many more things happening than just temperature. You know, there's temperature, there's pressure, there's the thickness of the puck, there's the there's the consistency and homogeneity uh, homogeneity homogeneity um, of the fines in the puck. It's how the coffee is ground. It's you know there are all these factors that come into play that are basically producing a one dollar shot of espresso, um, and we can't just fixate on one. You know, temperature is key and it's critical and it's important, um, but it's merely one factor. Um, and that, that's why, you know, technicians and designers have to be jack of all trades. You have to kind of be a barista to, to, um, to understand how the machines work. Okay, so I'm looking through some, I got, I've got one more. I'm looking through okay. some of our, our notes from our, sem our, our guild seminar, and it's under managing temperature complaints. And he wrote a statement. <laughs> you wrote a statement. You are a troublemaker, man. You wrote a statement yeah. that uh, and I meant to ask you about during our seminar is Americanos and how they kill espresso machines. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> troublemaker. Um, so explain this one to, to the group. Okay. On, on a, a, this is in particular on, on a heat exchange machine because, you know, you, you've got steam and water all coming from the same boiler. Um, espresso machines were not designed to be hot water dispensers um, and when you when you're pulling you know 10 or 20 ounces of water or even in some cases three americanos at a row you're pulling you know a pint of water out of your coffee machine um, then you're refilling it with all this cold water now the espresso machine is dealing with this this huge surge this huge temperature change because it wasn't expecting it was never designed to produce you know 20 or 30 ounces of water at one time um, now it has to recover. Now it has to figure out, well, what am I gonna do? Um, and the, the, the element is also part of a duty cycle process. So the element is you know, supposed to be on for you know, 10 seconds and then off for 20, on for 10, off for 20. Well, now you've introduced all this cold water in the middle of the day uh, and the element now has to, has to stay on for an extended period of time. Um, and elements die for a number of reasons. Sometimes they, sometimes they just simply fracture um sometimes they melt because the, you know the boilers run dry sometimes they just kill themselves from working too hard um and if you have an extended on time for an espresso machine um not only are you completely futzing with the espresso or with with the temperature and the pressure but you're also burdening the element itself and you know causing its premature expiration that makes sense so, thank you so pull it off the coffee brewer instead, or steam steam cold water with your with your steamer to make hot water. Okay. Um, People shouldn't drink americanos anyway. I would agree with you on that. <laughs> we try not to be controversial. Um, last, <laughs> Good luck. I, I'm going I'm to throw one last one in here because I've been in this I've been in this business for so long that changing elements is a common thing. We used to take old pavonis and gages and double the wattage on the elements back mm -hmm. in the 80s and the 90s. So let's discuss that really quickly and then we'll wrap up. So on your managing temperature complaints, you discussed changing element sizes and ramifications. So let's just quickly touch on that. Okay. Um, if a machine was designed to have a 2700 watt element, um, then its duty cycle and, and recovery is, is predicated upon that size. Okay. If you double the size, that element is going to run twice as hot as expected to recover whatever whatever temperature you're you're, you're trying to recover. Um, well, when express when elements turn off, they don't turn off like that. They don't turn off immediately. They continue. They they have residual heat. So that that the the element itself is is actually hotter than expected. So you're you, you get these kind of um, uh, if you were to graph out the, 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 the temperature of the system, um, when, when the elements are too hot uh, and they're not PID controlled in particular, 
uh, you get overshoot. So you can get overshoot based on the element. I'm working with a boiler right now um, that is PID controlled, um, and it's a relatively hot hot element in a relatively small boiler. Um, and I'm getting tremendous overshoot just from the latent heat from the element itself. Sure. So even though I've told the element to turn off, it's still radiating heat energy and it's overshooting the temp set. Um, so you could you have to sometimes you have to manipulate or, or change the wattage of the element to accommodate what you're doing, like the size of the boiler and things like that. You can't just you know throw a, a 454 engine into a Pinto and expect good results. Right. Thank you, sir. Do you have anything you want to close with before I do the wrap up? Um, God, I think that I've talked enough. <laughs> you, we, we have. Uh, Michael, thank you. Um, to people attending, um, if you're a guild member, there does exist a couple of Ask the Experts that are specific to the guild. The first one is on temperature, and it's a conversation between me, Michael Tian, and Don Burquist. And we're doing um, pressure the week after Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. Okay. And then the next uh, Ask the Expert for the public is going to be um, the opening, starting your business with. Uh, Christopher Brown, and then we'll get Mike to discuss pressure at some point in time here in season two, starting in January. If anyone has any questions, I've posted my email on the messages. Um, please reach out to me, or if you have any questions for Michael, we will get them to the presenter right away, and we will post the meeting and the presentation within the next week. Other than that, thank you. We will not see you next week, but have a great holiday. Mike, thanks again. Have a great holiday, and we wish you all the best. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for doing this. Let's see. Um, really good. We had a lot of really good questions. Um, I think we should definitely put in. Uh, oops, there you go. Richard is saying there are still 46 people live. So I'll give you a call in a bit. We'll do a recap. Okay, okay we're going to close it out. Thanks, Richard. I'll talk to you in a bit.